Thank you, Alison. Um, I'm just going to bring the, the level of the conversation down a little bit and, and talk to you uh, directly from the call face of uh, doing revenue projects in, in many countries over, over the last three decades. Um, so just to, uh, my, I think my, my uh, essential point is that there's little chance of sustainable economic development without effective domestic resource mobilization. I agree with Oliver about the confluence of aid and taxes. And I th uh, my, my argument would be that the purpose of aid should be to, uh, to, to have a flagship uh, project for, uh, for every country where the domestic ro revenue uh, d d resource mobilization becomes um, a key issue that is financed by aid. Uh, so at the very start, wh why do countries uh, need to raise revenues? Uh, first of all, I, I would argue that this, uh, it's even more important for aid recipient countries to, to raise their own revenues. It's clear that international development assistance is highly volatile and rarely sufficient for even the most aid-dependent country. Aid dependency places limits on sovereignty, as often uh, key decisions about investments are taken away from countries. On the other hand, raising taxes fosters buy-in from citizens and other taxpayers and, and increases uh, responsiveness in government, thus promoting greater governance and a strengthening of democracy. Uh, in my experience, this is particularly true at the local government level. Um, and as I hope to show later, an effective revenue mobilization <coughs> strategy helps to reduce fraud and corruption, thus promoting greater transparency in the public finances. Taxes also help to reduce inequalities, which themselves are strong uh, drivers of civil conflicts. Um, in the last three decades, I've observed uh, finance ministers and, and budget officials operate within an era of, of growing domestic fiscal resources. And I can tell you something that I think we all know intuitively and was, has been mentioned a few times this morning, uh, uh, that, that is that a dollar of domestically generated revenue is far more valuable than a dollar of donated funding and is generally spent wiser and speedier. Um, the inward flow of emigrants' remittances, while often much greater in value than international development assistance is equally um, inefficient for our purposes since remittances by their very nature are directed uh, towards households and tend to be consumed on typical household expenditure in the main. All countries compete for foreign direct investment, but these uh, inward investment flows are often patchy and sporadic and of course they flow towards areas where profits are seen to be possible, which is often where natural resources need to be extracted. Uh, indeed, they rarely flow to areas in greatest need of economic development and poverty alleviation. Um, the, the quality of FDI, which again was mentioned this morning, is uh, hugely variable, and poor countries often tend to attract the kind of footloose, transient, exemption-seeking investment that provides little or no linkages or job creation. Um, in fact, some countries prefer this kind of investment as it lends itself easier to corrupt practices uh, benefiting corrupt officials in the main. And finally, the potential revenues to be gained from effective revenue mobilization dwarf all other forms of financing. In a recent article, I set out some examples from the countries where I've worked, and I think these might be worth repeating, even though we are talking about nominal revenues. So in Kiribati, we increased revenues 400% uh, in a six-year period. In Lesotho, 2,000% uh, in a six-year period. Uh, Rwanda, we increased revenue 650% in a 10-year period. Um, Burundi revenues increased 100% in a four-year period, the last four years. Uh, in Rwanda, the, the revenue to GDP ratio grew from 11.9% to 14.1% in the same period. Uh, and quite often, a one percentage point growth in this figure is sufficient to outstrip the donations of the largest donor or donors. So what is involved in mobilizing domestic revenues? Domestic revenue mobilization means collecting taxes and other non-fiscal charges from a country's entire revenue base. It implies the effective use of these revenues for infrastructural development, both hard and soft, and for improved services, particularly health and education, to the population. Stimulating a country's own revenue base is the only sustainable way to provide the funds needed for infrastructural development and service delivery because all other sources of finance are smaller or less efficient than tax revenues. Um, I referred to the country's entire tax base because, in my experience, poor countries rarely apply taxes to their entire tax base. Uh, indeed, this may be true of all countries, but in poor countries, the exclusions are often dramatic and substantial. Um, just to give you a flavor of what they tend to miss out on, the effective taxation of non-residents. 
Non-residents often derive substantial income from a country in the form of interest, dividends, royalties, management fees, natural resource payments. And applying a simple withholding tax to these payments can often generate substantial revenues. Uh, reducing tax exemptions. Tax exemptions are granted for many and varying reasons. Studies show that discretionary tax exemptions do little or nothing to stimulate investment, yet many countries grant these in abundance. The value of Burundi's exemptions at the widest definition, and I stress at the widest definition, comes to 4% of GDP. Effective taxation of rental incomes. Residential and commercial property rents are almost always calibrated in dollars, paid into non-resident bank accounts, and they approach developed country values. These income flows, accruing as they do to the elite, are rarely, if ever, taxed. Um, the effective application of withholding taxes on employees. Often the government fails to withhold and remit tax on its own employees. In many cases, the governmental elite, and I'm talking about parliamentarians, ministers, senior officers in the army and police, and senior civil, ser se senior civil servants, simply refuse to comply with such taxes. The effective application of broad-based taxes such as VAT and excises. Although these taxes are borne by the final consumer and not by the collector of the tax, they are often poorly administered or completely ignored. So what's clear from the above very short and by no means extensive list um, dealing with revenue reform invariably involves dealing with the elite and compelling the elite to make a tax contribution for the greater good. Essentially, this means that the elite have to be brought within both the income tax and property tax net in all aspects. This is not an easy task and requires courage and political will. Um, it also requires donor, political and economic contributions, but sadly this support is quite often lacking. Donors do not yet seem to fully appreciate the importance of domestic revenue mobilisation. I think there's only 0.8% uh, of aid was targeted towards uh, supporting fiscal systems in developing countries in 2010-11. I mentioned earlier about corruption. A zero tolerance to corruption policy, policy is the oxygen for effective domestic resource mobilization. And while strong and transparent revenue collection can greatly reduce the incidence of and opportunities for corruption, without strong political leadership that includes a robust anti-corruption element, effective domestic resource mobilization is doomed to failure. To illustrate the negative impact of corruption, I just wanted to quote the eloquent words of, of Kofi Annan in the foreword to the 2004 UN Convention Against Corruption, where he said, corruption is an insidious plague that has a wide range of corrosive effects on societies. It undermines democracy and the rule of law, leads to violations of human rights, distorts markets, erodes the quality of life, and allows organized crime, terrorism, and other threats to human security to flourish. This evil phenomenon is found in all countries, big and small, rich and poor, but it is in the developing world that its effects are most destructive. <coughs> Corruption hurts the poor disproportionately, disproportionately by diverting funds intended for development, undermining a government's ability to provide basic services, uh, feeding inequality and injustice, and discouraging foreign aid and investment. Corruption is a key element in economic underperformance and a major obstacle to poverty alleviation and development." End of quote. Uh, I have first-hand experience uh, of countries engaging in corrupt practices because quite a, a leadership role which I've held in a revenue authority invariably, provi invariably provides a front row seat for viewing corrupt activity. And I've, I've seen extensive tax exemptions being granted to companies that went on then to provide personal benefits to senior government officials, including the construction of private homes and hotels for these officials. Uh, I've seen governments create new taxes and then divert the revenues from those taxes into private bank accounts and share the revenues from those taxes with private sector operators who then went on to make personal and political contributions in return. And my point is that effective revenue mobilization invariably means dealing with corruption and that involves creating the conditions for transparency in the management of the public finances. And therefore, if we're serious about generating domestic revenues, we must also be serious about holding governments accountable on transparency. Uh, one means of engaging on this is to form a coalition of donors. And we did this in Burundi uh, when the OBR reform was under threat and we created the <coughs> Diplomatic Friends of OBR. Uh, 
actively chaired by Belgium and supported by a wide number of donors, including the IMF, the World Bank and the European Union. The Friends of OBR met regularly, was fully briefed by myself, and this, this briefing has continued with my successor, and was able to take issues that otherwise would have escaped uh, donor attention directly to high authorities. While something like the Friends of OBR is indeed useful, the concept needs to be taken a step further and given teeth. We need to actively consider how, as the international community, we can incentivize not only support for domestic revenue mobilization, but also transparency in the management of the public finances and a zero tolerance policy towards corruption, not just in words, but in meaningful and measurable actions. Uh, it's true that no one likes paying taxes, but it's equally true that states greatly benefit when tax systems are well designed and intelligently administered and when the public finances are well managed. So unless domestic resource mobilization can be effectively achieved, resources on the scale necessary to make the development gains envisaged in the SDG simply won't happen as aid can never hope to fill the gap in my view. And I think donors must therefore put significant political and economic support into domestic revenue mobilization and transparency to the top of their agenda as a matter of urgency. So in conclusion, or in summary rather, uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that aid funding uh, must be directed more towards revenue projects. They should become flagship projects. I think uh, more fun this would imply implies also more funding for national audit offices and, greater, and a greater profile for transparency in the management of the public finances. Uh, technical assistance and IT systems, uh, spending on those is paramount in, in these interventions, uh, as are modern tax laws and procedures. Um, and you know, my, in conclusion, my, my, my role as Commissioner General, as, as an expatriate of, uh, in charge of the Revenue Authority in Burundi, I think that's uh, a possible intervention that we could consider in, 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 other, in, in other areas and, and we should think about how we can, we can do this. But those are just some, some of the thoughts uh, from, from uh, the actual physical ask, act of implementing revenue reform projects in, in development. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to all three um, of our speakers. Um, now, I think, you know, there's potentially a lot we can talk about here. And I guess tax and the after lunch session are a little bit of a difficult mix, aren't they? So I want to raise your enthusiasm in the sense that it seems to me that, you know, one of the things we might want to challenge is is nothing these speakers have said, but there's an implicit notion with the arguments about direct domestic revenue mobilization being a key driver of progress around the SDGs is that this is not a, a sort of distributionally neutral uh, aspiration, nor is it a politically neutral one. And I think we've got to engage with the issues around that have been put on the table about it very much depends on the tax base. It very much depends on what kind of outcome one is looking for in terms of distribution. Uh, it depends very much on, on the relationship between taxes and governance. And, uh, and I think these are sorts of questions that we might, might want to very much look at. And then to interrogate, what is the evidence that, you know, certainly uh, grant financing aid in particular is, has actually proven to be effective in underpinning revenue collection of the desirable kind in, in particularly <coughs> low and lower middle income countries. So um, I'll open the floor up to questions. I'll start this way and sweep round. First to Andy. Over there. Uh, 